Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Stern, and I'm the director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art, based in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. After 1938, Shanghai was one of the last places of refuge for Jews fleeing persecution by the German Nazi regime. In 1940, the Less family arrived there. Welcome to Through the Prism of Time, John H. Less, and his visual impressions of Holocaust Refuge in Shanghai. Today, I'm delighted to introduce two distinguished speakers. First, the son of the artist, uh, Stephen Less, who will speak about his father, his flight to Shanghai, and the Im uh, immigration to the US that follow. And then Hannah Lea Wasserfuhr, PhD candidate at the Center for Jewish Studies in Heidelberg, Germany, who will speak about the art of John Less. After their presentations, we'll have time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the Q&A function. Born and educated in the US, Stephen Less is currently a senior research fellow emeritus of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg, where he was editor-in-chief of an online research paper series, as well as managing editor of a semi semi-annual bibliography of public international law. While employed by the MPI, Stephen also worked for many years as an adjunct uh, law lecturer at Heidelberg University, the Heidelberg Center for American Studies, as well as Schiller International University in Heidelberg. And he continues to teach American constitutional law. Stephen dedicated himself after his father died in 2011 to collecting, preserving, and drawing public attention to his father's art and his history as a Holocaust refugee in Shanghai. He has meanwhile given presentations, participated in educational projects, and arranged for numerous exhibitions commemorating his father and his work in the US, Germany, and China. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, hello to everybody viewing this uh, Fritz Asher Society event. And many thanks um, for your kind words of introduction and um, for inviting Hanalea and myself to make the, our presentations here. Um, I'm, I'm uh, really excited and honored um, and grateful to be able to commemorate my father in this way. Um, to set the stage for what Hanalea will say after, after me, I want to briefly sketch my father's biography using what I think are key images from the uh, stations of his life, so to speak, in Germany, China, and um, the United States. Maybe it's best if I make this um, a, uh, a personal context by way of introduction. This presentation um, is taking place almost exactly 30 years to the date that I arrived in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, I originally came here from the United States after receiving an academic grant to do research at the Max Planck Institute, of, as you've heard. Um, after obtaining my doctorate from the University of Heidelberg, I found work at the Institute and stayed. My deeper motivation for coming to Germany was an urge to find out, to comprehend what had gone so wrong, which resulted in my father as well as other relatives having to flee and um, uh, some, 40, some four decades earlier and um, leaving others behind who perished in the Shoah. Already as a child, I heard bits and pieces of my father's story. Sometimes he showed me documents and other artifacts he had managed to save on his odyssey from Germany to China and finally to New Jersey, where I was born and grew up. Often I asked him about his experiences, hoping to learn more about what at the time sounded exotic and adventurous. Um, later, my questions became more probing and um, met resistance, some of which resulted from the fact that the longer I remained in Germany, the more tense our already complicated relationship became. Still, we kept in close contact. Between my annual visits, my father 
sent me copies of many of his mementos as well as photographs of his latest work. We in fact communicated repeatedly about his intention to do an autobiographical illustrated book for young people depicting his time in Shanghai. Despite my living farther away and having a career and family of my own, I encouraged him and assisted to the extent I could. Although my father pursued the idea of this autobiographical book, he never widely discussed his flight from Germany and struggled to survive in Shanghai with uh, other people. I also would not like to uh, uh, talk very much about his artwork. A tourist statement he once, once attached to work he submitted for an exhibition contains the essence of his attitude towards such communication. My works, he wrote, are shared impressions of what I have observed. Instead of explaining them in so many words, I prefer to express myself visually. My aim is to produce or induce rather an emotional experience and a cognitive process based on what touched me. Ideally, viewers will be moved to find their own meaningful interpretation of what I have attempted to communicate through form, color, and subject. I believe my father's reticence to articulate his thought processes or his emotional reactions verbally stands in contrast to his effort um, to memorialize his history, history visually. Unwilling or unable to draw attention verbally to what he experienced and to his artistic creations, he nevertheless felt compelled to exhibit his thoughts and emotions in graphic form. As a result, I don't feel out of line really by offering some factual background to his story, which he made certain that I knew, and by commenting and expressing my insights regarding his art and images that I recognize as representing the central aspects of his life. So let me begin this. Um, Sorry for the delay. I'm gonna skip over that, that first image because that's something that Hannah Leo will talk about. And uh, start with my father's childhood in Berlin. I doubt he would have chosen this image um, to illustrate his early life in Germany. It's hard to imagine Germany at the time he was born in 1923, um, at the time of a hyperinflation as a Garden of Eden. Although the country later, of course, enjoyed a brief period of political stability, relative stability and uh, prosperity even, and cultural bloom, the social peace and democratic framework of the Weimar Republic were severely strained from the outset. Um, soon after my father began schooling in uh, uh, the Weimar, system was replaced by the Nazi regime. The Les family with his very modest means lived at the time in a small apartment in Prenzlauer Berg, Berlin. As a child, my father frequently took walks with his parents from there to the freely assigned park, which you see uh, on the right side with his famous fairy tale fountain. My father described the nearby Zionist-oriented English class of Jewish private school, to which his father insisted he be sent as an oasis where he enjoyed perhaps the happiest period of his life. An art teacher there who recognized his talent for drawing um, provided my father with the encouragement and guidance that probably played a, a crucial role in determining the course of his career. It was with her guidance and support um, that he was commissioned age 12 by one of the largest Jewish newspapers in, in Germany to submit a year's worth of drawings to illustrate the Jewish calendar. It was his first paid freelance work. Um, the Kristallnacht, or Kristallnacht, the Nazi pogrom of November 9th to 10th, 1938, ended any illusions of coexistence between Jews and the Nazis. My father depicted what he found when he returned home on the 10th to find his grandmother and mother scrubbing anti-Semitic graffiti off the sidewalk under the supervision of stormtroopers and to the amusement of neighbors and passersby. 
At this point, like thousands of other German Jews, even my grandfather, my, my father's my grandparents recognized that it was time to leave. My father was, oh, my father's father, my grandfather was already unable to renew his commercial license that he needed to work as a sales agent for his father-in-law, his father-in-law's wholesale textile business. Before this. By the summer of 1939, the Nazis instituted forced labor for unemployed Jews. Uh, sorry, Stephen. Stephen, we, um, we hear a loud uh, noise from your papers. Um, so uh, just wanted to give you a head up. Sorry. You have to unmute yourself now. I'm sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, by the summer of 1939, the Nazis instituted forced labor for unemployed Jews. My grandfather was eventually assigned to do railroad maintenance work, a fate that my father was spared only because he received the notice to report for work only a few days before the family uh, left Berlin. Um, On September 5th, 1940, when my father was 16, a half a year after drawing this self-portrait and a year after Germany unleashed World War II by attacking Poland, the Lesses fled eastwards. The destination, their destination was a section of Shanghai's international settlement, which had been under uh, Japanese domination since 1937. My father drew this his family's escape route from Berlin to Shanghai to help illustrate the intended autobiographical account. The line marking their transcontinental passage shows the enormous distance they covered. Um, to me, the map also su suggests the tremendous uncertainty they faced. They felt they must have felt since they were practically penniless and knew next to nothing about their destination. Why Shanghai? In my father's case, Shanghai became a, a refuge by default. My grandfather had unsuccessfully applied for immigration elsewhere. At the time, Shanghai quite simply was one of the last places that allowed entry to Jewish re refugees. When the Mediterranean was blocked for civilian uh, shipping in 1940, overland passage from Germany to China via the Soviet Union remained possible by virtue of the Hitler-Stalin pact. So just before my father turned 76, he gave me this, um, a copy of his passport as a, he gave me a present. Um, um, and as you see, he's annotated it um, in a bit of understatement saying it's a, a bit of my history. Beginning with the red J, the passport is quite revealing. It was actually the Swiss who encouraged the German government to do this, to stamp the par passports this way after Germany annexed Austria in 1938. That allowed for easy identification of Jewish refugees whom the Swiss were determined to keep from flooding into the country. The, but the J device was probably unnecessary since Jews' passports already contained another identifying feature. Um, all males were required to add Israel as a middle name, if their name was not already recognizable as being Jewish. Women, correspondingly, had to add Sarah as a second name. My father's um, handwritten comment points out still another aspect of Nazi persecution documented by the passport. Um, um, it, it identifies him, namely, as, as having German nationality, although German Jews um, in Shanghai were deemed stateless. Actually, German Jews had already lost their, their status as full citizens under the Nuremberg race laws of 1935 and became mere German subjects. After, uh, after uh, November of 1941, they were stripped of their nationality entirely. And this is when my father officially became stateless. The signature that you see on, on the left on the next page um, that's marked with three swastikas is evidence of my father being personally for, forced to write Israel as part of his name. Um, 
the passport's validity had already technically expired um, uh, when an extension was granted. Already at this stage, in other, in other words, my father was lucky not to have been trapped in Nazi Germany. The exit visa needed to leave Germany was likewise um, extended and it allowed for departure either at an East Prussian border crossing into Lithuania or from the airport at Königsberg. Leaving the country by plane, however, was pure fantasy. Jewish refugees like my relatives could never have afforded plane tickets since they depended almost entirely on organizational and material support provided by the German Jewish agency, the Hilfsverein, which arranged for their overland departure. The um, persons who left Germany were only allowed to take the equivalent of 10 Eismark in cash with them, worth about four US dollars at the time. On the left, you see the entry by the German bank that faithfully records its application of the law limiting the amount of foreign currency that my father could exchange. Overland passage to Shanghai required a series of transit authorizations um, my father, my grandfather managed to collect these through tireless energy, persistence, and sheer luck. Taking a chance, he absented himself without permission from his railroad maintenance crew to apply for transit visas at the Japanese consulate in Hamburg. These were indispensable since the Japanese military controlled the rail connections leading from the Soviet border into Manchuria. My father's passport shows um, that separate visas also had to be obtained from Manchuko, um, as it calls itself, which purported to exercise sovereignty over Manchuria. And uh, naturally, a Soviet visa was also necessary. The itinerary they were provided by the Hilfsverein um, shows that some refugees in the group traveling eastwards were scheduled to split off and proceed on to Tokyo. Um, so here you see a sheet from um, a Moscow from of Moscow hotel stationery and interest coupons further documenting the passage through the Soviet Union. So we now we reach China, and the you see the drawing of the Jewish refugee, which hints at the shock the refugees experienced in Shanghai. My father had seen some difficult times before, of course, before they left Berlin and had a strenuous three week journey, but nothing prepared him or his family for what they encountered in Shanghai. The, in the so-called Paris of the East, as it was sometimes called, they found themselves confronted with sights, sounds, smells, and customs that were completely unfamiliar. Most of the inhabitants in this densely populated city looked, dressed, ate, and behaved different than they, they did and spoke an incomprehensible language to them. For many refugees, exposure, exposure to Shanghai's subtropical heat and high humidity to primitive and crowded accommodations without running water uh, or air conditioning or, or refrigeration to deadly contagious diseases, to chronic unemployment and hunger and to the pervasive presence of the Japanese military resulted in exhaustion, illness, depression, and anxiety even. They were constantly reminded of their tenuous situation as they saw examples of unimaginable wealth contrasted with abject poverty. The refugees quickly realized that they existed near the bottom of the social hierarchy where they faced a merciless struggle to survive. The less family was fortunate, however, to have its own accommodations and that meant my father, his sister, and their parents could avoid staying at one of the communal shelters known as Heimat that were established by the Jewish aid organizations. The space that they, this, this crowded space that they shared for seven years might have been tiny, but it, it had at least one advantage. And that was, as my father remarked in the letter, which included the sketch of the family's room that they didn't have to worry about break-ins uh, one could barely open the door without tripping over something to begin with. So this is one of the numerous efforts by the Japanese to register and identify Jewish refugees in Shanghai. This is another ID um, that was 
uh, necessary. Uh, I'll explain in a minute um, the reason. In February 1943, the Japanese announced that all stateless persons who had entered the city since 1937 could henceforth reside only in a designated one square mile area of Hankyu. And that meant that the Jewish refugees, it meant Jewish refugees from Central Europe. Um, Baghdadi or Sephardic Jews who were not British subjects and Russian or Ashkenazi Jews um, in Shanghai were not affected. Neither was my father in the sense that he had to move. The family already lived in Hankyu's slum area, which was also home to about 100,000 Chinese. What drastically affected the 16,000 or so refugees forced to live in the so-called restricted area was that they could not freely move about. Um, the refugees now had to per, uh, obtain a permit, um, like the one you see here, and an identifying pin, which my father has done in a uh, watercolor of, um, from the self-proclaimed King of the Jews, a Japanese bureaucrat named uh, Goya, in order to, live, to leave the, the ghetto. Despite Goya's reputation for maltreating applicants and arbitrarily preventing many from making a living, my father was always lucky in that regard and, and had his permit renewed. Um, the watercolor uh, scene below the, uh, the pin shows him having his permit inspected by a Japanese soldier at a checkpoint at, at the Garden Bridge, which connected Hankyu with the rest of the international settlement. In the next two slides, you see examples of designs my father did for um, the International Committee, the IC, as it was known, um, an important ref uh, Shanghai refugee aid organization. Um, this was his first uh, freelance job. Um, he was also able to work at Shanghai um, advertising agencies in the international settlement and the French concession. And you see some examples of his commercial art in the next few slides. Um, one thing was the almanac cover and the, the letterhead for the, the studio where he worked. And you see some banners for newspapers and other designs, uh, as well as um, packaging, candy wrappers, and even uh, store window designs, uh, designs for window displays. Um, the, the Chinese banknotes um, that you see here uh, were uh, not indicative of the fact that he made so much money or that, that he had money to spare when he left and brought these with him to the States, but rather that um, uh, the, the money became worthless after the war. Uh, when there was a rampant inflation. Um, um, my father's earnings nevertheless made uh, an important contribution to the family's survival. Since his parents were generally unable to find work, the, the family depended on food distributed by the Jewish community, soup kitchen, supplemented with, with whatever they could afford themselves. Um, and you see that with the bottom bank notes, my father has signed his name because the refugees often use these as uh, parting souvenirs. Conditions in Shanghai might have required the refugees to focus almost exclusively on maintaining their physical survival, but the cultural activities that they continue to engage in were probably just as important to keep them sane. My father thus didn't confine his energy and talent only to producing advertising. He also created stage settings for several operettas, for example, as well as this poster for one, uh, one of the operettas which debuted in Shanghai. Um, for my father and his family, Shanghai was never seen as more than a, a temporary way station. They applied, in fact, to immigrate further to the United States almost immediately after arriving. Here you see a negative response to the application that they got dated June 1941, which ended any hopes of quick immigration. Um, the next, well, these images show how desperate conditions 
became after the Japanese unleashed the war in the Pacific, it was not, not long before um, there was a shortage of food which threatened the refugees' existence. And here you see food coupons and uh, a sketch of the soup line and so forth. Um, although the refugees remained largely unexposed to any direct military hostilities, an aerial bombing of Hankyu near the end of the war resulted in many uh, civilian casualties, uh, both Chinese and Jewish. And the sketch that my father did shows people cowering next to a wall and nearby damage. Since the houses in Shanghai had no basements, um, even makeshift bomb shelters, at least in Hankyu, were practically unknown. Um, the um, sketch of the scavengers picking through um, a garbage container in Hankyu shows that Chinese were sometimes even in more desperate straits than the refugees. My father tried to explain the lane system that the house he lived in was located in with this sketch where, uh, of where the family lived. Um, in it, you can see he recalled the subtropical uh, flourishing, um, subtropical Shanghai's flourishing insect life, which uh, wasn't conf confined to the great outdoors. Um, here, the, the top photo shows my father's parents and sister together with his mother's sister and her family. The Chinese child holding the hand of his younger cousin suggests that his relatives had some contact with their neighbors. The second photo, the photo in the middle shows my father shockingly thin, I, I think, um, in, standing near his home in a surprisingly vacant lane. Um, it might be surprising as well in the context of the present COVID pandemic to see how early the Chinese tried to get a grip on contagious diseases. My father's vaccination record dates from June 1947, just before they left, when, when Shanghai was administered by the Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek. And you see the exit stamp at the bottom uh, shortly, uh, uh, which he obtained shortly afterwards, was entered into his invalid German passport. Um, although the war ended in 1945, the US only gradually loosened its restrictive immigration policy. It took another two years, in fact, until my father could get to the United States. An affidavit issued by the American consul in Shanghai allowed for entry since his German passport, again, as I said, was meaningless. Um, arrival in Shanghai occurred after the family crossed the Pacific on a former US troop transporter. My, the, these photos that show my father doing some sightseeing in San Francisco um, suggest how dreamlike the encounter must have been. So after a brief stay in California, the family traveled again by train across yet another continent, and this time to Newark, New Jersey. There they reunited with relatives who had immigrated uh, earlier. In the space of a few weeks, in fact, my father found work with Babberger's department store. He lived in the years that follow what I won't hesitate to call the American dream, um, having a family settling into his own house in the suburbs, even eventually becoming art director and vice president of the Bamberger's retail chain. And I've probably overpacked this slide with too much by way of example of his, his commercial art for Bamberger's, but to, to, my, to my surprise, it's, it's almost everything that I could find uh, of that sort. When he moved with my, my mother into a senior citizen living arrangement, my father apparently disposed of everything he, he considered artistically or, or historically superfluous. So determined to finally focus on his lifelong passion, he left Bambergers in 1981, not long after this publicity photo for Bambergers was taken. Um, it took him a while to adjust to the new situation, but over, over the next three decades, he was able to produce the bulk of the paintings, and drawings, watercolors, woodcuts, batiks, stained glass, sculptures, and sketches which form his legacy. 
that legacy, as Hannah Leo will confirm, I, I think, uh, includes obvious echoes of the past. For example, um, here the sight of the homeless living in the streets of New York City reminded him, no doubt, of what he experienced in Shanghai. It was a subject that con continued to haunt him, uh, inspiring this painting and others. I took this photo showing uh, a work in progress in the studio where he produced his last artworks. The canvas on the easel reveals the indelible marks, I think, of what he went through when he was young. On the floor next to this, you can see um, next to this image of a, a woman, a beggar, uh, uh, cradling her, her uh, naked child, you can see another painting making reference to his past. And here it is uh, in a larger version. Um, the self-portrait with German passport that again, Hannah Leo will comment on. Um, one of the things that I discovered on my father's desk um, after he passed away was a small crayon and watercolor drawing, a further self-portrait that he called the dream that shows a winged figure looking over his shoulder as he contemplates an empty page on which two paintbrushes rest. Uh, nearby, I found the slip of paper you see on the left on which he noted a, a passage from Exodus. It refers to an angel sent to protect Israel on its path. Whether the winged uh, uh, figure is an angel or his muse, or whether he consciously meant the biblical, the biblical reference to refer to the, the uh, the image, I don't know for sure. But to me, the, the note in the picture reflect my father's acknowledgement of the role that art played in his life and how fortunate he was to have survived a harrowing past and as well as to be able to create things that resonated with other people. It's probably not surprising to you that I, I believe my father had something worthwhile to communicate and that the images he left I think, attest to his abilities as an artist. And saying this, I know, and he would have been the first to admit that he was mostly self-taught, taught, that his professional life had revolved around commercial art, and that his story pales beside what other survivors of the Nazis went through. But still, the, the history of the Jewish refugees like him in Shanghai is not well known, and notwithstanding the many publications, documentaries, and exhibitions that have meanwhile dealt with the subject. I hope this visual biographical sketch has demonstrated that my father's story and art offers some insight into the, fight, into the fate of the Jewish refugees who fled to Asia, and it provokes your interest in learning more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, this, this, uh, you know, we already had the first comments. Uh, what a valuable resource this talk is. Uh, to um, to research and um, I think uh, there will be lots of questions coming um, uh, later on but um, now I uh, want to introduce our next speaker uh, Hannah Lea Wasserfuhr uh, who is a PhD candidate at the Center for Jewish Studies in Heidelberg. She studied art history and history at the University of Heidelberg, followed by an MA in Jewish Museolo Museology at the Hochschule für Jüdische Studien, Center for Jewish Studies in Heidelberg. At the moment, she's working on her doctoral thesis about the industrial production and marketing of Jewish ritual objects during the Kaiserzeit and the Weimar Republic. The PhD is funded by the International Ismail Elbogen Scholarship Program at the Ernst Ludwig Erich Scholarship Fund in cooperation with the Leo Beck Institute in New York. Welcome, Hannah Lea. Thank you very much. And also from my side, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very grateful to talk to you today about this very interesting and very fascinating story that is Hans um, less or John Hunt's less life and work. Um, I'll just stop my presentation. So, as we already heard, Shanghai is probably one of the most obscure places of rescue for Jewish refugees from Europe during the Shoah. 
But for about 18,000 refugees, it was a safe haven from Nazi persecution, especially for those who left in the late 1930s and had no chance to reach a different country due to the prevailing immigration laws. The harbor city of Shanghai, with its large foreign controlled ex territorial areas, required neither a visa nor any attestation for entry. Because of its special international status, the city became the last hope for those immigrants. One of them was Hans Les, Stephen's father, who changed his first name to John after immigration to the United States. To get to know Shanghai, a contemporary source, the Philo Atlas, Handbuch für die jüdische Auswanderung, Manual for Jewish Immigration, printed in Berlin in 1938, provides a perfect starting point. The guide says about Shanghai, biggest and most important harbor city in the north of China, 3.5 million persons, most of them Chinese, 7,000 Jews equals 0.2% of the population, three synagogues, composed of A, Chinatown, B, French concession, and C, international settlement occupied by the Japanese since 1938. The entry also indicates that urgent warning must be given against entering the country if the possibility of setting up a business had not been examined beforehand. After invading and occupying the Chinese portion of Shanghai in 1937, the Japanese seized control of the entire city in 1941. Restrictions for the Jewish refugees were tightened in 1943 by imposing restrictions on Jewish immigrants. The Japanese could be seen as honoring their commitment to their German allies. Whatever the ultimate intention of the Japanese were, the Japanese military government proclaimed a portion of Hongyu as a designated area for stateless refugees i.e. the so-called Shanghai Ghetto. As Stephen already told us, Hans Les was born in Berlin in November 1923 into a lower middle-class Jewish family. In the late 1930s, he began taking private art lessons with Alfred Fred Goldberg. He also worked briefly as an intern at a large printing company while attending a vocational school in 1938, the only possibility for him as a Jewish pupil to continue his education. To escape Nazi persecution, the family fled from Berlin to Shanghai in September 1940, where they later lived under precarious circumstances in the Shanghai ghetto. In this presentation, I would like to show you some works of John Hans Les, which were created in Shanghai or in his later years, dealing with his experience as a refugee. There will be th three focal points to my survey. First, I will contrast Les' earlier works with those in which he later revisited key moments through the prism of time. Secondly, I will discuss Les' approach to Asian culture. As a European artist in Shanghai, I will place special emphasis on how his perception and representation of Asian culture differ from earlier European depictions of Asia, especially during the period of European enthusiasm for Japanism and European artists' travels in Asia in the early 1900s. Finally, I will turn to a personal level and inquire to what extent we may witness the formation of John Hans Les' identity as a young refugee in his oeuvre. By way of an outlook, I will compare his work to other refugee artists from Shanghai in Shanghai and suggest with all due caution that there might have been something akin to a cycle or school of Jewish refugee artists in Shanghai. The self-portrait is dated February 1940, meaning Hans Les created it at the age of 16 while he still lived in Berlin. Less than a year later, 
1941, he sent a letter from Shanghai to his grandparents in England, describing his family's living condition in their small crowded room. The letter is accompanied by a drawing of the room with numbered explanations. As could be guessed already from this illustration, the time in the ghetto had a huge impact on his work. It was where he started working as an artist with limited supplies at hand, while also earning a living by designing advertisements. Shortly after arriving, he was paid a commission, in fact, to create publicity posters for a Shanghai refugee charity. It comes as no surprise that John Hans Les, throughout his lifetime, tried to cope with his experience by revisiting life-changing events in drawings and paintings. Of the recurring motives that can be found in his oeuvre, I'd like to pre present three by way of example. What started as an explanatory drawing for his grandparents became a recursive motive. The later watercolor version was intended for the autobiographical Young Adults book, meaning John Les wanted to have his work speak especially for, to a young audience, something for which he was perfectly trained as a commercial artist. While the watercolor has a clear structure, the painting with its shortened brush strokes and dark but still colorful palette conveys a feeling of confinement and the anguish of a teenager subjected to difficult living conditions. The stop in Minsk on the way to Shanghai must have made a similar deep impression on the 16 year old Hans Les, as he and his family traveled to China via the last possible escape route with the Trans-Siberian Railway, he sketched an elderly couple resting on a settee. The sketch, is also a, sorry, the sketch also shows a person trying to sleep in a chair using baggage for support. Probably there were no settees in the waiting room in Minsk which keeps us wondering if this couple were traveling on two continents with furniture in addition to their luggage. However impossible this may sound, the fact that there are these settees remain puzzling. All the more so, as we know that Les family could not travel with anything more than a small luggage. Les revisited this motive in later years in three paintings while the first version depicts a moment of calm during the journey on the right-hand side. The scene gets much more crowded and unsettled in later versions, in which furthermore, another new element becomes conspicuous. A young boy wearing a red top watches the resting couple directly in the center of one picture, in the other, the boy appears to be leaving the scene with an elderly father figure. Presumably, the boy represents Hans Les, once alone and once together with, with his father, as the title Papa and Me suggests. But why does the artist revisit the situation and incorporate himself into this motive? He seems to be reassuring himself about his own experience while setting a monument for his father, who looks like an organized protective figure leading his son. Also the passport in his father's hands with the bright red J stamped on it is notable. Stephen already presented Hans Les German passport with a discriminatory J stamped for Jew. This mark will reappear later again. Another highly impressive motive is the begging Chinese woman with her child. In the first version, a watercolor from 1946, the woman wails and cradles her dead child while an older girl standing behind her tries to comfort her mother over the death of the younger sibling. At the same time, a finely dressed woman in European clothing passes by heedlessly. 
In a later painting of the subject, the scene seems less drastic at first sight. Although the poverty and hunger remain obvious, given the empty wise bowls and the nakedness of the child. Instead of the finely dressed woman in European clothing, there seems to be a person in the background having his lunch. Meaning right next to the starving mother with child, there's a food vendor they cannot afford. Poverty and wealth are very close by in this crowded limited community. However, the screaming child is at least still alive. Seeing a mother agonize over her dead child must have had an enormous impact on Les. Maybe the situation also reminded him of the well-known subject of Christian art, the Pieta, where Mary mourns over the dead body of Jesus. But what happened over time until he made the later painting of the scene? Perhaps after becoming a father, he subconsciously de-escalated his memory to avoid the unbearable sight of a starved child, or the situation becomes even more poignant when the child is still alive screaming for the neighbor's meal. In the later depiction, the woman passerby has disappeared, making us wonder about the relation between foreign inhabitants and the Chinese population of Shanghai. Les no longer wanted to show the disconnect between Europeans and the Chinese, which the passing women suggested in the earlier version. However, he should, uh, however, we should bear in mind that the foot of the former in the former version could also belong to a wealthy Chinese woman who adapted a Western lifestyle. Thus, the removal, as well as the initial inclusion, does not necessarily reflect a tension between the Chinese and the foreign population. Most certainly, he portrays the sharp contrast between rich and poor differently. And in any case, he was well aware of the separate lives of European refugees and Chinese inhabitants, according what he told his son, Stephen. His earliest Shanghai painting is a portrait of an unknown Chinese child from 1944. Due to a lack of resources, it was done on a canvas made from a cotton rice sack. The child's look has an air of anger, hardness, but also power, which is accusing at the same time, reflecting the fact that the child probably has seen a lot of hardship. The revisiting of motives and scenes less experienced in Shanghai shows impressively what his time in Shanghai meant to him, how traumatizing some of the experience must have been and how deep an, an imprint they left. Yet we also witness how the graphic depiction of history through the prism of time reflects the artist's memory uh, in coming to terms with his experience. But Les' work is more than a personal reflection on a traumatized youth in flight from Nazi persecution and on the harsh living conditions in Hongyu ghetto. In them, he also played with and deconstructed European visual stereotypes regarding Asian culture. Images of Asia have, to be sure, always been part of European culture. One finds evidence of this, for instance, in European porcelains, but European trade and colonialism were also impacted by ideas about an exotic and supposedly untouched Oriental world. Through prints and postcards, images of this world became well established in the cultural memory of Europe. In addition, around 1900, Japanism was an important inspiration for Western artists, especially in the graphic arts. These artists imported the aesthetics and of Asian woodblock printing, like the Japanese ukiyo-e and sumie, the Japanese and Chinese ink printing, into Western art, and some even traveled to Asia to collect direct impressions. <clears throat> 
while Les found himself in China, in China involuntarily as a refugee, he nevertheless also collected impressions of Asian culture and living in the international harbor city of Shanghai of Asian European encounters. Thus his works for, forms uh, much Thus, his work forms a much uh, a part of a much bigger story of European Asian encounters and European fascination for what Westerners deem to be exotic. Three motives exemplify this fascination and play with its cliches. First, there's the motive of a coolie done in 1947. One can see the coolie pulling his heavy load with extreme exertion in a crowded Shanghai street. Next to him, one can catch a glimpse of a big Chinese man in a rickshaw reading his newspaper and smoking a cigar. In the later painted version of this motive, the latter is more clearly visible. First, the less breaks with, his, with a fascinating with a fantasized notion of an ideal Asian culture in several respects in this everyday motive. First, he does so by emphasizing the exertion related to the coolie's work. Secondly, the motive also demonstrates the vast difference between rich and poor in Shanghai society. Thirdly, the wealthy Chinese man is shown with Western attributes, a newspaper and a cigar which are not germane to this idolized vision of an Asian world. Another example relating to the Western fascination with Asian culture is the motive of a street barber cleaning his client's ears. This light ink drawing resembles Asian graphic art in style, simplicity and composition, as well as with its airy lack of depth. But instead, of drawing, but instead of drawing such traditional subjects as landscapes or animals, Les shows a very profane but uncommon situation for Europeans and challenges our expectations. While Hans Les had already received some artistic education in Berlin, where he might have learned about styles and technique and aesthetics, he may equally well have learned about such things through Shanghai refugee publications, such as the Shanghai Echo, the Shanghai Jewish Chronicle, or the Gelbe Post, which also featured articles on Asian culture and art. In a similar way, Les employed the motive of person as seen from behind carrying his rice paper umbrella. The scene appears exotic to the Western eye at first glimpse because the umbrella is an icon of Asian visual culture. But Les deconstructs the stereotype of an Asian adult by capturing the scene in dark rainy weather. Besides the man standing in the rain, one can make out the conscious of additional people in the distance. Looking closer, it becomes clear that the person holding the umbrella with one hand is holding up his oversized trousers with the other so they don't get soaking wet. This is once again, no idyllic representation of Chinese culture, but rather a glimpse of the mundane inconveniences of daily life. An irritation similar to, to one we experienced before is also present here. The Chinese street footstool seems to show a family business with the father cooking, the mother serving tea to a customer and even the little children working. One child has fetched fresh water and an even smaller child who lacks a trouser assembles wood for the stove. Instead of showing a cultivated and tranquil Asian tea ceremony, 
The picture takes us to a hectic family business where even the scantily clad infant needs to help out. In the later version of this motif, which was meant to be an illustration for the autobiographical youth book, Les changed some key elements of the scene. While trying to preserve the memory of his experience for the next generation, he also seems to be reassuring himself about his own experience as in other paintings by incorporating himself into the picture. Here he is standing at the stove as if he wants to try the food. The little child is no longer assembling wood, but now rather, but rather seems to be crawling around aimlessly. With these changes, Les might have tried to soften the scene for his intended young audience. By incorporating himself into the picture, moreover, he becomes a participant, whereas he was previously an outside observer. This poses the question about what the connection between Shanghai's Asian and European inhabitants were like in the first place. As Stephen told us, his father left Shanghai for the States in 1947, thanks inter alia to the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. The time he spent in Shanghai was of eminent importance for the formation of John Hans Les' identity, as we see especially in the evolution of a self-portrait. As noted, one dates from only a few months before he fled from Berlin, another from December 1946, shows him shortly before the end of his stay in Shanghai. The seven years which passed between the two drawings the first done when he was 16 and the second when he was 23, spanned a period generally known as being quite influential in forming one's personality. In comparison, the later self-portrait shows not only a more accomplished style and technique, but also an older man who has experienced hardship and seems to be a very reflective person. Jo John Les formative years were defined by his being a Jewish refugee, a condition marked by one very striking discriminatory sign, the J in his German passport. Aside from encountering it in the passport, we also find it in the painting Papa and Me in Minsk, and yet again in the painting Jewish Refugee in Shanghai Ghetto. The latter painting is based on the sketch done in Shanghai in 1940s, which shows an elderly man in a stooped posture clinging to a little package. It suggests that this sole item is all he has left. In the painting, the red, the, a red J, part of the eagle symbol used under the Nazi regime, and the words Deutsches Reich, elements that appear in Les' passport, cover the refugee's leg. Like a ball and chain, they seem to keep him from moving or at least to slow him down and cause his bent posture. We see a figure in limbo, caught between moving forward and the impossibility of returning. Similar to this anonymous refugee, John Les struggled with his relationship to Germany in later years. For instance, he could not understand his son's decision to settle there and accordingly broke his vow never to return in order to visit him only three times in 30 years. Although it was an experience forced upon him, which was accompanied by hardship, uncertainties and danger, less refuge in Shanghai resulted in his surviving the Shoah and significantly formed his life and became part of his identity. At the age 83, at age 83, he continued to reflect on his defining years in yet another self-portrait. Here he depicts himself with, paint, with his paintbrushes, his means of communication, 
in the background in the tradition of an artist's self-portrait. As Stephen told us, he did not talk a lot about a lot to others about his experience as a refugee, but preferred making references through, uh, in, to it through his art. This picture incorporates the discrimin discriminating and defining J discussed before, but this time Les is partly covering it with his fingers and he's holding it, he's holding his passport with an attitude of praise and normality. The combination of the paint brushes and the J in his late self-portrait suggests an acceptance of the fact that art, as well as his experience as a Jewish refugee, made him the person he was. This was a small glimpse of John Hans Les' work depicting his experience in Shanghai and how he dealt with his memory through the prism of time. But I would like to conclude by offering a broader perspective on the Shanghai refugee artists and their art in order to contextualize John Les' work during the 1940s. As I already mentioned, Les took private art lessons in Berlin with Alfred Fred Fredden Goldberg. By chance, Goldberg also found refuge in Shanghai, where he and Les renewed their contact for a time and may have worked together on at least one commercial advertising project. When compared to the work of John Les' teacher, the Shanghai artwork of Friedrich Schiff, Paul Fischer and David Ludwig Bloch, they show similar stylistic elements and as well as common documentary approach in their choice of motives. This raises the question, whether a Shanghai refugee art cycle existed at, that worked together either directly or indirectly. Conceivably, this happened through the association of Jewish artists and lovers of fine art, ATA, which organized exhibitions in Shanghai from around 1944 onwards. Even though we do not know whether John Hans Les was a member of ATA, there's evidence that he and David Ludwig Bloch knew each other as well, as Bloch gave Les some prints of his woodcuts as a farewell present before they both left Shanghai. In addition, Les took part in at least one exhibition in Shanghai together with Bloch, Fischer and Goldberg in 1946, one year before he immigrated to the United States. He is highlighted in the broker. Because of this linkage, I think further research about a possible Shanghai refugee artist network would be worth pursuing. This might provide solid footing for recognition of the Shanghai Jewish Refugee School of Art, of which John Hans Les was a young but important member. Be that as it may, John Les works art on one hand, a personal reflection of a traumatizing experience. On the other hand, they are work of art in their own right, which offer insight into the encounters between Asia and Europe in a very unique political, social and cultural mix that was 1940s Shanghai. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Hanalea and uh, Stephen, for your presentations. And I just keep looking at the chat and the Q and A, where uh, um, everybody is uh, very engaged. Like a heated discussion actually uh, started over the Chinese uh, mother and child, whether that child was really dead or not in the watercolor, uh, whether she in the watercolor was uh, just uh, finished nursing because her blouse was unbuttoned and maybe the child fell asleep um, and uh, so uh, this uh, we don't I don't think we have time to go back to that and and really discuss it here uh, but both your presentations answered many of the questions that came up uh, during the talk for example James asked about uh, 
uh, uh, whether uh, John Les was uh, in a network of uh, artists in Shanghai and whether he knew Ludwig, uh, David Ludwig Bloch, so that you just answered. Um, and actually, uh, there's another question that I you know, uh, I want to ask as well, is there any chance that John Les paintings will be made into a book of uh, for children? Um, and um, here the anonymous um, uh, writer says, I'm a religious school educator and would find such a book to be a valuable resource. And uh, Stephen, I know that your father intended uh, uh, his uh, watercolors exactly for that. So I hope, you know, that uh, this will happen in the, in the very, uh, very near future. And um, I uh, want to thank you. And I want to actually uh, agree with, um, agree with uh, uh, Susan, who uh, said already a while ago, excellent presentation of a remarkable artist. I learned so much about refugees in Shanghai. And uh, I think this combination of both your research and your resources and the documents that you presented um, taught us a lot of new uh, information and at the same time made the the experience uh, very uh, that your father uh, depicted uh, Stephen very tangible and very um, very personal. So thank you to the two of you. Um, I um, yeah I w wish everyone well and uh, take care everyone and see you soon.